Um, I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you in person, which of course I would want to be, um, but uh, I'm afraid I'm extremely vulnerable to the COVID virus, and so I'm not able to, to do long distance travel at present. My thanks, my very deep thanks for the award of this doctorate, honorary doctorate. Uh, I am truly honoured uh, by this. The award of an honorary degree is supposed to be a festive occasion, so it should be followed by party. Uh, our party will have to be electronic as far as I'm concerned, but I'm delighted that we will hear a performance of that splendid medieval drinking song, Gaudeamus Igitur, at the end of the ceremony. I went to university as a student back in the legendary 1960s, which did not feel legendary at the time. Um, at the end of that decade, I became a full-time academic and worked in various universities for 44 years uh, before retiring uh, just a few years back. Uh, in all cases, in social sciences, though moving um, from one area uh, of social science to another. The, at the time I began, at, uh, as a student, when I first was you know, spending my time in universities, it was a time of considerable trouble um, in, in my country, in, in Australia. We faced war abroad because Australia was a small participant in the war in Vietnam. Uh, and we faced multiple forms of oppression at home under a corrupt and conservative political regime. The universities at the time uh, seemed to me uh, to be conservative uh, and complacent institutions, uh, not what uh, young uh, intellectuals uh, would want as their workplace. And I, like many others, uh, began to ask uh, what knowledge was actually relevant to the process of changing the kind of society that we lived in, in the direction of social justice, peace, um, and in, in due course, um, the security of, of the, the society and the species. And I came to the conclusion that the kind of knowledge that was needed was knowledge in social science. Uh, that's why I moved into social science as a graduate student. And that's an opinion I still have, that it's the social sciences above all that will produce the knowledge that is most important to us in grappling with contemporary issues of violence, oppression, and of course, climate change as well. Well, that was a decision that I made to go into the social sciences and some of the directions that decision has led me, you've just heard in the uh, kind uh, uh, statements uh, of our colleagues um, giving the, the laudatio. Um, I've in the course of my career in social sciences have worked on multiple social structures, multiple institutions. Um, I've worked collecting life histories from quite a variety of different social groups. And I found myself doing research in schools, um, in offices, in high rise buildings, in working class farms, in the outer suburbs, uh, in ruling class farms, in privileged uh, suburbs, suburbs beside the, the, the harbour, 
Um, I've even found myself doing research in a sewage treatment plant. So become a social scientist and you see the world in one way or another. Much of my work, uh, as you've already heard, um, was concerned particularly with the structure of gender relations. Uh, and within that territory, um, with the specific issues about masculinities, how masculinities were made, what differences exist between different patterns of masculinity, and how patterns of how forms of masculinity change through time, uh, both within a single lifetime and on the macro scale uh, at the historical level. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in formulating these questions and launching this research at a time when those issues began to appear significant to to considerable numbers of other people in feminist movements, um, in education, in health research and the like. So as I began formulating my material, studying the interviews, uh, considering the institutions and beginning to get those findings out through the journals, uh, eventually in the form of books, uh, through talks at conferences and talks with practitioners, such as health workers and teachers, it really felt a bit like um, catching a wave feels to a surfer, where you put in a certain amount of effort and then you find all around you a surge happening um, and a, a truly remarkable change uh, uh, occurs. Uh, I guess particularly important for me at that moment was finding that the research that I was doing in an academic context truly had practical applications and applications that I had not necessarily thought of at all. Um, so uh, a new departure uh, in that particular field of social science initially as a conceptual debate and as a bit beginnings and beginnings of empirical research was suddenly relevant to and useful to a whole range of users in other institutions and contexts. That was truly exciting and is the kind of, of experience that, that I wish to, to all my colleagues in, in the sciences, whether social, natural science, um, uh, either uh, that can happen. The experience of working with a range of colleagues, uh, with a range of users, was something that made me think also about the nature of my own practice as an intellectual worker. And it made me particularly conscious of the collective character of the process of developing knowledge. Um, something that uh, was not just local either. I mean, about half of my research, I guess, has been done in teams, the other half in one way or another individually. But the even the individual uh, research and writing that I did was always in a social context of support from other university workers academics and non-academic workers as well. And as I increasingly realized, a global uh, context uh, of knowledge producers and knowledge users. So that, for instance, I truly learned uh, about the division of labor in knowledge work from an African philosopher, not an Australian, not from the global north, but from an African philosopher, Aline Mpongi, who I think formulated more clearly than anyone else the notion of the global division of labour in knowledge. And I learned my understanding of the historical character of human sexuality 
from a Brazilian feminist above all, Peleia Safiotti, a wonderful, a wonderful thinker, um, who's little known in the Anglophone world, but I hope will become more so over time. And those kinds of learning, those experiences of learning um, and of understanding more of my own context led me to think, uh, to theorize, and to a certain extent research also about the global economy of knowledge, the shape of the transfers of information, the circulation of concepts, and the struggles around knowledge that occurred on a world scale. And it's that kind of realization that eventually led me to the work that became my book, Southern Theory, and to the work I've also done on the shape of gender theory uh, around in different parts of the global south. And that uh, those uh, lines of research and lines of thought led me to think also about the nature of the knowledge workforce, something that I think is is much underplayed in the contemporary discussions about, uh, about universities. Because when you think of it, the intellectual work of the contemporary time, however much individual academic stars and, and leaders, however much we rightly admire their work and their contributions, nevertheless, the basic process of developing knowledge is a collective process involving a large workforce, including what I call the operations workers, the non-academic workers in universities, as well as the academics. Universities, I've worked in universities all my working life, as I said. Universities are um, in, in many ways privileged institutions uh, we have powers, we have weight in the world, and we have capacities, especially, I think, the capacity to communicate is the fundamental power of universities. We do this through uh, our referee journals, of course, but it's also relevant to the the well-being and, and, and value of universities, that it should be a place where poetry and music and drama are also present, also active in the formation of consciousness and the development of understanding. In my view, the fundamental business of university, the fundamental role of universities is a service role, servicing the people, the people as a whole, not just the particularly privileged groups who form policies um, in the world, not just the people who turn up as our students or our, our clients, so to speak, but the whole of the people. Uh, and that's why the issue of social justice is, to my mind, core business for universities. We also know now that our service has to be a service to the planet, to the well-being of the whole of the life uh, on this planet and even the material, uh, the, the non-living um, elements uh, of, of our, our planetary life. That, I think, that um, process of serving uh, populations and, and the planet has become harder over time. It's become harder in our generation than it was when I began to think along these lines and began to work in universities, partly because the economic context of universities has changed. University systems have massified, but they have also privatised. They're less likely universities um, now are more likely to be profit-making corporations or closely associated with profit-making corporations and are more likely to have borrowed 
their management techniques and their formulations of strategy from the corporate management techniques of the profit-making economy. We also face in this generation more intense opposition to the making of organised knowledge than we did before. We've faced anti intellectual movements, climate denial movements, answer causation denial movements, the anti-gender movement, which has already been mentioned, and we can expect other movements of opposition to organised knowledge uh, to come down the track too. In that environment, uh, the work of intellectuals can be uncomfortable, can be difficult, um, can be more challenging, I think, than I ever expected it to be. But the fundamental role of universities, uh, 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 academics and, and intellectual workers in general, to my mind, remains the same. It's our job to push the boundaries, to challenge conventions through our work, and in our research and teaching to establish and disseminate truths however uncomfortable those truths might be and however much they might be challenged. And gender studies is now a clear example of that, that uh, the challenges to the development of knowledge and the spreading of knowledge about gender issues are now quite serious, even in some contexts dangerous. And for that reason, among others, I'm very glad of the recognition which is given to that field through the award of this honorary doctorate. I'm now at the end of my academic career. I still do some writing, but um, I'm no longer doing funded research. Uh, I rest on my laurels to some extent and have to think of myself as a senior. Um, as one of the older generation. Um, and I have been thinking about the specific role uh, that seniors may play in the uh, world of, of knowledge production of intellectual labor. And I think our fundamental role as seniors is a support role now. And it's a role where our experience can play and be valuable in a somewhat different way. It's our role um, particularly to support and help protect the knowledge workforce as a whole, the younger generations of the knowledge workforce who now constitute the collective intellectual of our time so my best wishes to the younger generations, the rising generations in the field that I've worked in and to our colleagues in other fields. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you again for the very great honour uh, of this uh, award. I'm most grateful. Thank you.